Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back again. Let me just uh, do one thing. I got to go close a window. Sorry, it's right up till the beginning of class time, but oh, we'll get started right away. One second. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hi there, guys. Violetta, Monica, Brianna, Delilah, Gazi, Rohi, John, Roxana. Welcome back, everyone. And feel free to leave behind some type of comment in the chat just to get your attendance on the record. Um, yeah, so let me just get my notes open here. Today, what we're doing is we're going to talk a little bit more about um, advertising and marketing. So we have this kind of little mini unit in the class that's just dedicated to um, the media, advertising, marketing, impressions. And we discussed some of that on Thursday at the last lecture. And um, I have a little bit more note on that from chapter 10 today. Basically, the, um, the notes on this material are a little more breezy, a little less definition based. So it's not going to be like a ton of bullet points as normal. Um, but the stuff that I will talk with you guys about today will help you a little bit with the upcoming homework assignment that I'm going to assign. Um, and if you look at the syllabus, you would see that that homework assignment was originally designed for, um, let me make sure I'm giving you the correct date. It would have been next Thursday, the uh, 22nd. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extend it until the Friday. Uh, so you'll have until the end of the day, Friday night. So there'll be an extra day, basically give you a little more margin of time. And that's going to be all about finding examples of fallacies in advertising and marketing. So like in commercials, ads, and other forms of media. Um, so, you know, the lesson today has to do with fallacies and uh, using critical thinking to approach media and um, advertising content. So it'll be helpful for that purpose at least. Okay, so let me just get my book open here. And <clears throat> And also, did you guys notice that I uh, sent around the answer key for quiz two? So you can use that answer key to score your own quiz if you like, but also if you have any other more specific questions about your own work or your overall progress in the class, you can email me anytime and I'll get back to you within two days with a reply. Um, but that answer key does show the answers for quiz two that you took a week ago. And if you want to know how you did, then you can simply go back to the file that you sent and um, compare the answers that you provided with the list in the key. And for each answer, if you have an error or something that you reported that's different from the answer key, then you would subtract three points from 51. So there's a maximum of 51 points for that quiz. There were 17 questions, each one valued at three points. So 17 times three is 51. And, um, you know, so for each question you got wrong, it would be minus three. So it would go from 51, 48, 45, 42, and on down the line, depending on how many you got wrong, or if you got them all right, then you get 51. Okay, guys, so because um, I had to kind of make a decision about breaking the content of the media lectures into two parts to give us more time for both meetings, we may not go the full uh, time today, but if not, then we'll just have a little bit of an extra break um, in our schedule. And one more thing that I want to say to start the class meeting today. In the syllabus that you would look at, you would notice that this Thursday we have a meeting that's just des designated for videos on media literacy. Um, back when we used to have face-to-face -face meetings, I would always utilize one class day to just watch these interesting um, videos and lecture series on the effect of marketing and advertising and how to approach it as a critical thinker. Um, but nowadays, obviously, we're all remote, so I won't be able to play that. I thought, okay, I could hold a meeting and, on Zoom, and we could all watch it through a shared screen together. But I'd rather you be able to have a little bit more flexibility for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the videos and links after this class meeting today. I have one more um, section that I'm teaching from 10 to 11.15. But after 11.15, pretty much, I was going to send off the links for those videos. And instead of having a normal... Um, live stream lecture like this on Thursday, you could just watch those videos and that'll take up the uh, time as a substitute for the typical meeting. So basically we won't have a formal class meeting on Thursday, but I will send you these video links and that'll be what you're assigned to watch. 
instead of attending the class. The total duration of the video links may come in at just perhaps a little over a regular class period. And so I guess that justifies a little bit the uh, time that you're getting back today if class ends a little early, which I think it probably will. Okay, so just a couple things I've started class with today just to summarize those points. Um, you can go ahead and look at the answer key I sent for quiz two. I'm gonna send instructions for homework three after class, and I'm also gonna send the video links for those videos that you can watch for our Thursday meeting. Okay then, so let us uh, go back into the book and just have a few uh, breezy discussions about marketing and advertising and commercials. So this is all stuff from chapter 10 of the book, and that's all about analyzing advertising. <clears throat> Analyzing advertising. So, um, why are some companies so good at marketing and advertising? And likewise, why are some of us so susceptible to the uh, messages and information that we hear there that persuades us to purchase products and services from these companies? In this lecture and based on this chapter 10, we're going to learn a little bit about marketing strategies and the um, critical thinking skills that are needed either to be effective at making you know, ads that actually um, drive the sale of a product or service, or if you're on the consumer side, as most of us are, we'll also try and develop some skills that are needed to avoid being manipulated, ripped off, misled, um, or confused by information that we see in ads and, and marketing materials. So there's three major purposes of ads. Um, what are ads out there trying to accomplish? So three main purposes of ads. Okay, so one main purpose is simply to create product awareness. <clears throat> so sometimes with an ad or some kind of ad buy, commercial, whatever it is, they're just trying to remind you of the existence of the product or service like that it exists, just to make you aware of it, not necessarily to tell you much about it, whether it's suitable for your needs, um, what features the product or service may have in comparison to your needs and interests. But sometimes you're just going to see uh, the logo or the name of the product or service, and that's the whole extent of the ad. And that would satisfy this first major purpose. Say you're driving around and you look off and you see a billboard off to the side, and the billboard just has Coca-Cola logo with a characteristic font splashed against that red background, and that's the whole ad, just Coca-Cola, just the word in that characteristic logo font. Um, that's not telling you what Coca-Cola is, why it's the best drink, tastes great, less filling, it's not telling you, oh, here's a new flavor or something, it's just reminding you, hey, Coca-Cola is a beverage company, we exist, here's our logo. So the next time you're out at the grocery store or whatever and you're thinking of buying a beverage, you know, that idea might pop up into your mind and you might want to buy it. So one function is simply to create product awareness. Um, and that can be achieved even just with the sighting of the logo of the thing or its name. But another main purpose of ads beyond that is to inform consumers about a product or service. So, to inform, <clears throat> and this is a more traditional function of advertising and marketing that was really the major um, function of them in the earlier generations of media and uh, marketing. So, <clears throat> if you look at a lot of old-fashioned commercials, and even today, of course, a lot of current-day ones, you're going to see commercials that try and tell you about the product or service to give you a motive and a reason to want to buy it. So, if it was like a car commercial... Uh, it might be saying things about the features of the car. Here we have the best safety record, um, zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds. Um, we have like so much interior space. If you look at our customer satisfaction record, we rate very highly. And so they might tell you all these things about the nature of its features, its amenities, its record of performance. Um, 
And that would tell you about the product or service itself, not just show you like a Ford logo, but tell you why you might want to buy the new car in the Ford lineup. Um, and I noticed if I look back into like classic television and stuff, a lot of the old school commercials that your parents and grandparents watched were more closely t tied to this because um, nowadays I think these advertising and marketing firms have to try and get more creative to compete for our attention because we have like 10 different options. We could be watching TV, watching something on our phone, on our computer, um, and therefore they kind of sometimes just want to make us laugh, direct our attention away from whatever else we were focused on. So in the olden days, I think because they have more of a monopoly on our attention, they would just have these more traditional ads which would tell you, here's why the product is so good, here's what it does for you. But of course we still do see that a little bit. So that's the second main purpose of ads. And a third purpose, major purpose is to create or to um, motivate consumer demand. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe you see an advertisement for like a particular type of soft drink and they say um, purchase now because you might have a chance to win an all expenses paid trip to Cancun, um, or you might have a chance to win a brand new Ford Focus 2021 car, like some sweepstakes or raffle that purchased the product uh, enters you into. That motivates consumer demand, but it's not because of the nature of the product or service itself directly. And it's not, again, in this case, just merely reminding you of its existence. In another case, motivation for consumer demand could be to drive up the sale through sex appeal or something, right? So like in a commercial, you might just have a bunch of uh, really good looking models or something that are promoting the product and they don't really say much about it, but just their appearance makes you think that if I bought this, somehow I might be more successful socially or attractive or whatever, or in the elite group or the popular crowd. And so these are three major purposes of ads, just reminding us that the thing exists, giving us non-product based motives to want to de demand it, and then also simply to tell us about its uh, service or product and the desirability we might have in terms of our interests. And of course, ads can accomplish more than one of these functions in a single case. Um, so sometimes you'll see a variety of these different functions achieved in one and the same ad. Um, and advertisements, of course, appear to us in all kinds of everyday familiar settings. In a way, I feel like we're living in a part of history where we're drowning in media and marketing information because we can't really get away from it. Um, how many different places will you see something advertised to you? Well, when you're on your phones, you'll see them online. When you're on the computer, of course, the same. When you're watching TV, you know, they're all throughout the commercials and the intermissions. When you're out there in physical space, you're seeing billboards, you're seeing posted signs, you're seeing even on people's clothing, logos and stuff, and then they become kind of like walking advertisements for the products or clothing lines, et cetera, brands. Uh, that they emboss on their clothing. You're watching sports, you're seeing it on jerseys, you're seeing it in the arena posted on walls. Um, so we are surrounded by advertisement and by its nature, it's persuasive. It's trying to persuade you to purchase something. So an advertisement doesn't want to leave you alone. It doesn't want to say, just do whatever you want. Um, maybe you don't want our product, that's fine. No, it's trying to intervene into your life a little bit and tell you, hey, open up that wallet, give some money to this product or service, and then you'll have it and our company will make a profit. Um, so know that the motivation behind the creating of the ads is the profit motive for the company or the vendor that wants to make uh, money off the sale of this good or service. That means that it's essentially persuasive information. It's not geared necessarily towards truth and objectivity, but rather profit. And sometimes that means that you have to be critical about the information that you're hearing because in many cases it contains little information about the actual product. In many cases we could be upsold on something that we don't necessarily need or wouldn't have even wanted if not for the effect of the ad on us. Um, so there's a lot of very clever and resourceful and skilled advertisers and marketers that have ways to bypass our intellectual defenses to get us to want these things and therefore we have to kind of equip ourselves with critical thinking skills so that we make the right call and only act in our own best interests. So we're daily exposed to tons and tons of ads. Marketing research firms spend billions of dollars every year to identify the target audiences of their products and then create ads and placement that are geared towards those demographics. 
One way of achieving this is through the use of what are called Nielsen ratings. That's what's done with television. With Nielsen ratings, basically statistics are collected on the type of demographic groups that are watching particular programming at different times on the channels that you know we have on TV. And by culling this data and determining what kind of demographic groups tend to watch given programming, they can then more effectively uh, place ad buys in the commercial space that are going to target and appeal to those kinds of groups. So that's why perhaps you may have noticed that when you're watching, like, I don't know if it's like a children's show, um, the commercials are going to be geared towards products that children would perhaps want more, like candy or toys or little games, video games, stuff like that. If you're watching a show that more has a stereotypically uh, female demographic, then there are going to be products and services advertised there that might appeal towards a feminine sensibility or aesthetic. Um, you know, if it's sports or something, a lot of times they'll know that they have the, like, 18 to 44 male demographic as their core constituency there, and they'll place ad buys targeted towards the sensibilities and F preferences of those kinds of people. Um, so it's not like these ads are just out there and it's kind of random who they appeal to. There's a, there's a lot of uh, method to the madness in terms of how ad buys get placed and to whom they appeal. Ads can also be placed in the programming and that's another thing that we should uh, understand. So here's a new definition for the board. Product placement. Race. <clears throat> okay. So let's all understand product placement. What is this? <clears throat> Okay, so advertising that appears in the programming itself instead of during intermissions or commercial breaks, that's what's called product placement. So it's when uh, the product or service um, appears in the media or, sorry, in the programming itself. So... <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> product placement. So one effective marketing strategy that gets around the desire that some people have to avoid being advertised to is to use product placement. So product placement simply places the advertised product in the programming or content that you're trying to watch instead of off to the side during intermissions or breaks. If you're watching like a film and a character in the film is walking around um, drinking like Coca-Cola, um, in that case, it's not an accident. It's not like, oh, that's just a random scene that happened to make it into the film and no one had an intention for that necessarily. No, there's definitely a specific licensing agreement that has to be entered into between the vendor, Coca-Cola, and the media production company that creates that film. Uh, because basically, you know, the, pr the film production company could be even sued by Coca-Cola if they utilize the logo or image without appropriately um, compensating them because that could, of course, increase the appeal of the film if it trades on the branding of Coca-Cola. So there has to be an agreement entered into. And therefore what happens is the company approaches the film company or, or vice versa, and they agree that this product can appear in the programming um, and then they'll be compensated for it. So the advertisement space is basically in the film or in the TV show or um, in the YouTube video itself instead of during a typical dedicated commercial break. Um, and this bypasses our attempts to sometimes evade commercials because if you're a person like me, I don't know, I'm not the hugest fan of always being advertised to. My philosophy is that if I want to buy something, I'm going to do my own product research and I'm going to seek out the facts and information on it. I'm not going to wait for someone to make a commercial geared towards me and then based simply on the information provided by the uh, vendor themselves, make the decision to buy it. Because obviously I want to be a little more objective and careful. I know that an advertiser has every interest in selling me their product and they're not going to tell me maybe where there's a flaw or 
something that could be better about it or how it compares against other products that serve the same purposes. Uh, so anyway, that means that sometimes when I'm out here watching media, I'll try to avoid commercials. So if I'm watching TV, you know, I mute the commercial, or I change the channel to watch something else during the breaks. Or if I'm watching like YouTube videos or something online, I'll skip past those commercials the second I can or mute them or open another window. But here's the thing, if you have product placement, there's nothing you can do. If the film character starts busting out an Apple computer and driving around in a Lincoln car, I'm not gonna be like, I'm walking out of this movie because on principle, I refuse to see an advertisement while I'm watching the film. I mean, it's in the film, it's paid to watch the film. So you kind of want to complete the viewing experience even if there's clandestine ads placed in there. So anyway, here's some stuff from the book on this. Um, <clears throat> ads may also be embedded in a television program. Product placement is an advertising strategy in which a, a real commercial product is used in fictional media and the presence of the product is a result of an economic exchange between the media company and the business that produces the product. Most product placements go unnoticed unless and until we make a conscious effort to notice them. Coca-Cola appeared on American Idol for several years. Uh, that's one of the brands that's been placed most frequently. Um, you guys, as I was saying before, if you watch sports, there's a lot of product placement there. If you watch, like, say, NASCAR, you're going to see all the decals embossed on the vehicles for different product sponsors of the driver's car, and that means that you're kind of being advertised to the whole time while you're watching the race. Um, in tennis, sometimes, which I watch, you'll see like a Mercedes-Benz logo on either side of the tennis net so that while you're watching the players rally, you're also being reminded uh, to have product awareness of Mercedes-Benz automobile company um, and football and other sports. You'll sometimes see decals and logos for different products and services embossed on the um, walls of the stadium where the players compete on the field. And they mentioned that here, the logo for a sports apparel company such as Nike or Wilson Sporting Goods may appear on sports uniforms and equipment. Automobile companies frequently use product placement. It's been done in the movies, the movie Transformers, every car was made by General Motors. The sale of Reese's Pieces candy increased 60% after they appeared in the 1982 film E.T. 2020 James, 2012 James Bond movie Skyfall featured both Coca-Cola and Smirnoff vodka. And then they just continue going on to give further examples. Apple Computers is one of the biggest users of product placement, products appearing in almost half of the top films in the past few years. Um, so it's kind of funny that because some of us would prefer not to watch ads unless we choose to seek them out, um, you also now see this interesting trend of like companies that, that do provide advertising in their media offering you like an exclusive version of their service where you can't see, where you don't see as many ads. So like YouTube, for example, this is a little annoying to me because I watch YouTube videos. It used to just be that if you sat through the opening um, advertisement or skip through it, then you can just watch your entire video play through. But I've noticed now they've started to try and get around uh, that um, avoidance by making some of the ads pop up during the playing of the video. So like you'd be watching, five minutes, 10 minutes in, all of a sudden, there's a break for like a sponsored ad that you can't really skip because it's in the middle of your viewing experience. Um, and so then if you wanna avoid this stuff, you're being told to buy a YouTube premium, uh, which doesn't have the same ads, uh, and therefore you're kind of paying them to allow you to not watch ads, which I think is kind of a funny thing. Anyway though, let's continue from there. It's effective because you can't mute or change the channel if it's in the program. Um, so next up, we'll talk about the effect of television advertising and marketing on children. Children watch a lot of uh, TV and also digital uh, media through the internet on their smartphones and devices. Um, in fact, according to the statistics that we had pre-pandemic, which I think are going to be even larger now if new numbers were taken, but anyway, hopefully the pandemic is just going to be a short-lived thing, so this is not the new normal. But anyway, pre-pandemic, um, oh, and Violetta comment, good, good, thank you for that. It is so annoying, but YouTube will never break me. I'll never buy YouTube Premium. Yes, I've heard people say the same. I kind of feel the same way. I tweeted that, to be honest with you, because I saw someone else tweet something similar, and I was like, okay, I agree with that statement. So I tweeted that out, and then I was surprised to see that some of my followers were like, wait, I've actually purchased it already, and it's not too bad. But um, we got into a little debate over that on social media. I was like, but come on. I mean, couldn't you have just waited for the ad to end? And 
I don't know, I guess there are some people that really uh, value it that much that they would spend the extra money um, to avoid the ads. But I, I'm kind of on your side, Violetta, for sure. But yes, um, to back to the kids though. Uh, kids are watching a lot of media, um, whether that's between television and internet. It's upwards of four hours a day. And that means that if you take it in uh, over the course of an average week, we've got children watching over 20 hours of media um, in a given week. And so that means that if you just take down the amount of um, commercials and advertising that they see within that time span, um, it's translating to about five hours of commercials and ads a week. Children as young as 18 months of age can identify brand logos. So that's kind of imprinted into their brain at a very young age, like the Nike swoosh or whatever. And if you take that across the course of an average year, a little child is going to be exposed to as much as 40,000 advertising and marketing impressions in an average year. So that's just an average number. Some have a little more, some have a little less. Um, and when you think about the effect of all that, media and advertising information on a young impressionable mind it really does have the ability to shape their perspectives and consumer choices in their life going forward because at that young age as you guys know with no fault of their own because people that are young are obviously inexperienced in this world and have a lot to learn but when you're young and uh, not fully experienced in life as a child is then you can't yet identify the fallacious reasoning and the clever tactics that are being used on you to try and win your support to a brand or product. Um, and you'll also notice that because this is well known to advertisers and marketers that if you can get a young person to become an early um, loyal customer of the product or service, then they'll be in there for life. So they try to make that appeal by using sometimes cartoon characters and um, product mascots that appeal to the sensibilities of children. So think of all the sugary cereal brands um, that have like a, a cartoon-like mascot or sponsor figure like Lucky the Leprechaun or the Trix Rabbit or Tony the Tiger, um, Sugar Bear from um, Golden Crisps. Um, I mean, I'm probably forgetting a few, Captain Crunch, uh, Count Chocula. So like all of that is geared towards the sensibility of children who are going to see these cartoonish characters and want the product more because of that. And then you have uh, Ronald McDonald with um, with McDonald's and uh, the Hamburglar with, uh, is that also McDonald's? Well, there's the King from Burger King. And so it seems like in all of these different cases, they're really trying to get in there early with the young people. So in a way it helps if you're responsible for children or that you oversee them to monitor and oversee their uh, media consumption habits because you don't want them to become um, overwhelmed by the information or make poor decisions that are gonna serve them, uh, not serve their interests later. Um, you know, even sometimes there were controversies in like the 80s and 90s, there was the camel for uh, camel cigarettes and he was like a cartoon character and I think that they actually had to strike down the old uh, cartoon appearance of him because they thought that it was having undue influence on young people. I've heard some people say that the flavors and such of some of these vape products are also geared towards the tastes and sensibilities of young people and that's caused some controversy, like maybe they should eliminate some of those additional sweet, fruity flavors and just replace them with menthol flavors so that it's not something that you know gets young people addicted to nicotine and um, cigarettes and tobacco at a young age. But anyway, um, since we're all children at some point in life, uh, we can learn from this, but we can also pass that knowledge down to the next generation when we have the chance to, to care for kids. Um, Advertisements can serve an important role. I don't want you to think that it's all doom and gloom and just a negative picture here. There's kind of two sides to all these stories. They can serve an important role by informing us of products and services and that we want to know that product information. But of course, you have to keep a balanced view. They can also manipulate us into buying things that we don't need or that we might not even have wanted, if not for the effect of the ad on our judgment. Sometimes they can manipulate us by appealing to our emotions through fallacious argument, through rhetoric, and through emotional language. So we have to be aware and learn what techniques are being used on us. Um, sometimes we see common fallacies in ads. So the next little part of the discussion here is definitely directly relatable to the uh, homework assignment that you guys will turn in next Friday because that homework assignment is going to ask you to go out into the world and seek out as many commercials you can find which contain different fallacies that we've studied. And if you can find at least one, one uh, ad that has each of the 20 fallacies, then you get perfect credit for that homework. 
But what are some of these examples that we can think of? Well, uh, one case is scare tactics, right? Appeal to force. Um, how is it that sometimes ads utilize this way of reasoning? Well, the ad promises you a solution to a problem that you should be scared of having if you don't buy the product. So it'll say something like, hey, you're going to have bad breath, or you're going to have dandruff, or you're going to smell bad. Um, you're not going to look right if you don't buy this product. And so go ahead and buy it, and you won't have that issue. But there's kind of an implied um, incentive there that is the incentive of fear. And that's what's also written in the book. Many ads rely on fallacies and psychological persuasion rather than credible information and rational arguments. Scare tactics, for example, are used to create anxiety or play on our fear, insecurity, or sense of shame. We are told that we're not good looking or thin enough, that we have bad breath, body odor, or dandruff, that we have an unattractive personality or the wrong clothes, or that we're poor parents. And then the ad promises a solution to the problem, which in some cases we don't have or wouldn't have thought we had without the ad itself pointing it out. Um, now, just understand that sometimes the appeal to fear is a core feature of an advertisement, and you'll be able to notice that also in some of these clips that I'll send around to you guys that um, show some fallacies and ads. I have one of the clips that I'll send, which I think is going to be the last one in the list, is going to have examples of common fallacies seen in some Axe commercials, like men's body um, uh, deodorant and kind of body spray. And there's a lot of funny uh, fallacies in some of those that you guys will see, so I'll leave you to watch them later. But another example could be questionable costs. Sometimes you have an ad that makes it seem as if when you purchase their product and use it, everything changes for the better. And obviously, in many cases, that's questionable. So in some cases, the character in the commercial will use the product, and immediately they're having the time of their life with somebody beautiful and having a great relationship, like as though... You know, simply drinking a Coca-Cola puts you on the beach with a bunch of really attractive people, and that's the content of the ad. Um, in other cases, it will say that, oh, you purchase our ad, and next thing you know, sorry, you purchase our product that's being advertised, and next thing you know, you're thin, or next thing you know, um, you're, you're in perfect health. Um, so obviously, a quick fix solution uh, is questionable cause type of fallacy. It says that here in the book. Um, other ads commit the fallacy of questionable cause by creating a false expectation that something wonderful, such as becoming more beautiful, thinner, more popular, happier, will result if we use the product. In other cases, you'll see popular appeal as the driving force behind the ad. It'll make it seem as though everyone's using this product, so you don't want to be left out and be the one loner that doesn't have it. I've seen commercial for like um, Apple products like iPod in the past where it shows people in every different walk of life, every kind of age group, old, middle-aged, young, rural, urban, you know, third world, first world, everyone using this product. And so it's supposed to evoke the idea that this is a universal product. Everyone is using it in this planet, and therefore you should go out and get it. Um, could be a case of popular appeal. Another possible situation of popular appeal could be when uh, a popular celebrity figure is used as an endorsement sponsor for the product. And it's simply because they're popular that we are being told that we should buy it ourselves. Um, sometimes we see fallacy of inappropriate appeal to authority. Another common example where the person who endorses the product <clears throat> doesn't actually have any relevant expertise or skills uh, re related to the product itself. One case of that is the George Foreman grill that's mentioned in the book. And George George Foreman was a heavyweight boxer, one-time Olympian, um, you know, legendary uh, fighter in the ring, um, but not necessarily a culinary expert or a chef or anything. Nonetheless, he's very likable and uh, friendly kind of personality. So he was approached by the company, and they said, look, will you, uh, for a fee, become our product sponsor? I think you can make a lot of money together. You'll pitch the product to everyone. We'll call it the George Foreman Grill. And um, we think that with your name and face attached to it, a lot of people will want it, which, of course, did it, it did end up being the case. But you might argue that this person, George Foreman, is not the first individual that you'd look to if you're trying to buy appliances, electronics, or uh, cooking equipment, just in terms of his general base of life experience and skills. Um, I've seen recently some ads with um, Michael Phelps trying to talk about um, some type of app that helps you Maybe it's not an app, but it's a service where it helps you receive um, uh, clinical psychology and therapy for mental health, which is a good thing. But I would have thought Michael Phelps, really? I mean, he's an Olympian swimmer. I would have perhaps had a pre prefer to see a clinician or some type of actual person in the medical field talking to me about this product. Um, I mean, I'm 
I definitely respect his performance um, in the uh, in the pool in the Olympics. I mean, he's a decorated Olympian, but how does that carry over to his argument here about whether I should seek this service or whether it's the best product to provide for that particular need? Um, hasty generalization. Sometimes advertisements generalize by using stereotypes. So sometimes the people who are depicted in ads reflect overly broad stereotypes of particular categories of people, like uh, women are represented as young, like as sex objects, very thin um, men, like kind of mindless, pleasure-seeking hedonists and things like that. Sometimes um, uh, like cultural stereotypes having to do with race will also appear in some of these ads. Um, so we also have to make sure to not harbor um, any kind of overly broad general assumptions about people because of the way they're depicted in advertising and marketing, which in some cases is not a true reflection of reality, but a projection of um, you know human bias and emotion. And um, sometimes we see amphiboly within advertising and marketing. Uh, the textbook mentions a case like this, and I've seen ads like this. It'll have a confusing language saying something like, come check out our website, lowest airfare on our website guaranteed. Now, when it says lowest airfare on our website guaranteed, it's a little grammatically ambiguous because one interpretation of that is this is the lowest airfare that any airline will offer and we can find it on their website. Basically, that would mean this is the lowest airfare you can find anywhere and come to our website and it'll be there. But another interpretation, which is possible given the grammar, is the lowest web, the lowest airfare that is on our website is shown on the website. So like we place the lowest fares that we offer right on the front page of the website. That means something different though than lowest airfares in general advertised on our website. And if you go because you're curious about the ad offer due to its wording, then you're already going to perhaps make a purchase once you get there, even if it's not actually accurate that these are the lowest prices you can find anywhere. And if you pursue the question further, I'm sure that they would be able to tell you, well, I mean, look at the wording, it's carefully worded. It says lowest prices, lowest airfare on our website guaranteed, but we didn't say lowest airfare anywhere per se. And they leave you to try to sift through the grammatical ambiguity to come to the right conclusion. Um, Another common example is the naturalistic fallacy. We see this one a lot, where a product or service is advertised to you on the basis that it's natural, um, organic, green, whatever the case may be. Cigarette companies will say, hey, buy our product because this is all natural, organic tobacco, as though that changes its addictive potential or possession of carcinogens. Um, in the book, just to look at a few words, it says, other ads may employ the naturalistic fallacy, equating what is natural with what's good for you, false dilemma or equivocation on a key term such as free. Advertisements for natural American spirit cigarettes all not only commit the fallacy of popular appeal, but also suggest incorrectly that because their tobacco is all natural, it's not harmful like other cigarettes. And the text asks, what tobacco is not all natural and why should all natural tobacco be safer? The ad does not say. Um, <clears throat> okay. Sometimes we also see rhetorical devices and misleading language um, within advertisements trying to shape our viewpoint and get our purchases. Um, you'll see euphemisms which try to enhance the desirability of a product. Um, so as we've said before, a product that's being advertised which is small is described instead as compact, cozy, or quaint. Something which is old is labeled charming or full of character. Something that is really cheap is called a great value or um, economical. Um, so understand that obviously the use of language is going to be shaped in a way that's going to try and make the product seem most appealing to you. So we have to be able to see through the occasional use of euphemism and even dysphemism. Sometimes it is hyperbole, exaggeration or overstatement about the claims of a particular product. Um, must see TV. It's not really that you must see it. Uh, Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Well, I mean, that's a little exaggeration. It's not necessarily that only champions eat it or that you have to be a champion to eat it. But it's a turn of phrase. The rhetorical turn of phrase makes it seem more grand and valuable. Sometimes emotional words and phrases try to shape your perspective toward the product, making you want to buy it. So we see a lot of positive language surrounding the nature of given products. Like we are told that this is a fresh, um, free, light, alive, and that's to evoke positive feelings that will become associated with the product. 
Um, sometimes there are faulty and weak arguments, like bad analogies in an ad. Take, for example, the Chevy slogan, like a rock. Um, well, they're trying to tell you that the car's like a rock because they want you to draw on the associations of durability and sturdiness that rocks call to mind. But aside from the language used, there are really not many relevant similarities between any automobile and a rock. First of all, automobiles require maintenance. They require replacement of parts. And they do age out of their utility after a certain number of years and miles. So saying like a rock might make it sound like it's an indestructible thing that's been here forever and it will never go anywhere. But again, it's a rhetorical turn of phrase and it's a poor analogy, a poor comparison. Sometimes we see hasty generalization from stats without much information about how the sample was chosen. Like um, in one case, Tempur-Pedic, which is a mattress and pillow company that has this kind of patented um, memory foam technology or whatever, they have one advertisement which says, our sleep technology is recognized by NASA, raved about by the media, recommended worldwide by no less than 25,000 medical professionals. They give the number 25,000 medical professionals, hoping that you will generalize from this, that everyone in the medical profession stands by Tempur-Pedic. But we should ask a critical question. What is 25,000 in, in relation to? How many medical professionals are there and how is the term defined? As the book points out, does it include nurses? How about um, chiropractors, massage therapists, nurses aides, hospital orderlies? How large was the sample? And uh, how was it chosen? There are more than 700,000 physicians in the U.S. and 3 million registered nurses. So if we included only those two groups in the category of medical professionals, then 25,000 of them would represent only 1%. So, you know, 25,000 sounds like an impressive number until you compare it against a much larger cohort of people and you realize that it's not a significant quantity of the overall number of people. Um, so it's always good to do your fact-finding and research when you see statistics and data that are offered in that kind of way. Um, so a critique of advertising is a fair thing. Obviously these ads can be critically viewed as having some detrimental impact on society because they may manipulate us into purchasing non-essential things that divest us of our money so they create markets for non-essential goods and services. Another bad product is the targeting of minorities and the poor. I don't know if you guys would be surprised to know that um, and this is a fact which is mentioned in the book, that <clears throat> magazines such as Ebony and Latina have twice as many ads for junk food, cigarettes, and alcohol, and one-fourth as many ads for health-promoting products compared to magazines read primarily by white women, such as Good Housekeeping. Um, so in a way, you might be concerned that some of the more harmful and um, destructive products are being more closely marketed towards groups that are already at a socioeconomic disadvantage, which of course, would tend to promote further inequities between the haves and the have-nots. And, and it also is true that in developed countries which are abandoning tobacco products more and more, in like the first world, tobacco and cigarette products are actually on the global decline. But what that's caused to happen is that some of these same companies now are shifting their resources and advertising resources to third world countries um, and trying to make a bigger appeal to those people, which means that in the global sense, um, again, more dangerous and harmful products are being more heavily marketed towards people that are already at some type of socioeconomic disadvantage. So people that are the healthiest are not being marketed with the unhealthy products, further contributing to the, uh, you know, intensification of the, the haves and have-nots. Um, and that's it saying here, more people giving up smoking in developed countries, tobacco companies are stepping up marketing efforts in developing countries, particularly those in Southeast Asia. Um, Ads like that, of course, can harm. I mean, to the extent that ads are out there, even promoting the use of any kind of addictive substances like tobacco or alcohol could, could be seen as encouraging addiction and disease. Also, and this is, a, I think, an important point, <clears throat> the status quo that we live with, with so many ads that are so expensive to produce, that actually causes the cost of the product to the consumer, to us, to increase by as much as 30 to 40 percent. Just to give you one simple example, of the most expensive ad buy that you can purchase. Uh, you probably have heard that buying a 30 second spot during like the Super Bowl is extremely expensive because of how many people are watching the Super Bowl. So that means that it's expensive to purchase a 30 second slot because it's highly desired since you're going to reach the entire, um, you know, 
market. Now, <clears throat> when you spend, let's say, millions of dollars to run that ad, and you're also giving a nice kickback to some celebrity figure to appear in the ad, um, how is it that you're going to compensate and recover the lost revenue that you had to expend in purchasing the ad buy, buying the fancy um, endorsement figure, and whatever other graphics, special effects, and production that has to go into actually creating the ad? Well, you have to recover those costs by increasing the product's price to the consumer. So we basically take on the additional costs associated with creating these ads. And think of that ironic catch-22. That means that when we buy the product, we're not just paying for the product itself, but we're also paying all the overhead costs that go into making the commercials. So we're kind of paying for them to make more commercials to advertise for us more products. Um, and you know, if we just had a little bit less emphasis on this marketing madness, then products would be cheaper. We wouldn't have so many commercials and products would be cheaper, but you know, this is the state of play that we're living with. One other uh, critical point to raise is that big companies obviously have a big advantage financially over mom and pop local businesses when it comes to purchasing ads and um, marketing. So if you have like Joe's Hardware Shop, just a little local mom and pop um, hardware store, are, how are they realistically going to compete when Home Depot comes into town and has this giant footprint um, with tons and tons of uh, supply and that can advertise on TV, on the internet, in physical space Maybe this little mom and pop Joe's hardware store can run some local ads in the local media and put up some posted signs on their doors and have word of mouth. But it's going to be hard for them to stay in the arena when you have these big international, multinational corporations that have unlimited um, revenue to use for ad purchases and that can set up so many different locations. So, I mean, in one way, that makes you concerned that um, with the advantages that the big businesses have in terms of their market share and advertising dollars, that that's going to monopolize the market down to a couple of consumer choices, therefore depriving us of a full free market of competitive options. So um, those are the critical points. But like I say, you always want to have balance. And you can also see a way of defending the status quo against some of these criticisms. So on the other side, the reply would be, that the ads are really just catering to our already existing cultural values and interests. And so therefore, they're not really causing us to make bad decisions. Or if they do, it's on us because we should know better. Some would say that the uh, marketers and vendors, there are laws against outright false advertising. So it's not like they can say anything and get away with it under the law. They can bend the truth. They can use fallacies. They can use rhetoric. But they can't say something that is definitively false outright. Otherwise, they would make themselves liable to false advertising lawsuits. So, like for example, if a hard, if an electronics store said, "Better get in there tomorrow uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon," we're giving flat screen 60 inch Sony TVs away for five bucks. Um, line up early um, and get yours. Right. So you go you you go to the hardware store. You see there's like a line down the block. People camping overnight because everyone's trying to get these five dollar flat screens. Then doors open. And it's like, hey guys, okay, look, just kidding, ha ha, surprise. There's no five, there, no one would sell a five dollar flat screen. We just wanted to get you in the door, but now that you're here, look at what we do have. We have some pretty good products and deals. Well, if that actually happened, that that you know store would be sued for false advertising, and they would lose because they said they had these five dollar TVs. So you can argue that because there is a backstop of legal protection against totally false advertising, that we should be able to make fair decisions about the, you know, truth and. Um, stretching of the truth that ends up actually coming down to us. Um, given that, most people, you could argue, can figure out on their own what's true about the product, and a resourceful person doesn't just take it from an uh, advertiser themselves. As you guys know, you can and probably always should refer to other sources of product information to be fully informed as a consumer, like go on the internet, check other media reports or consumer reports. So if you're thinking about buying um, a nice meal at a restaurant, you don't have to only listen to the advertisement put out by the restaurant. Obviously, they're not going to tell you, look, we have a couple of items here that aren't so tasty. Instead, what you probably should do is go to like a crowdsourced um, online resource that can tell you what people think in general, like Yelp. Okay, so in the world we're in, you know there's advertisers and marketers, but there's also ways to comparison shop, 
check the views of other people who've purchased the product, see what their reviews are, and then come with a fully informed decision. So you can argue then that although we have these ads that are sometimes misleading and fallacious, we have ways to make judicious choices given the tools that are available to us. And um, <clears throat> you could argue that the harm to free speech would perhaps be the greater concern if we were to crack down on some of these media companies and advertisers, um, curtailing their free speech and not allowing them to make such bold statements about their products or to be a little more honest, you might say is the greater concern rather than um, their ability to mislead the consumer. And you can reply to concerns about monopolization by the big companies, which I was just mentioning, by saying, well, that's just the free market at work. That's just the winners winning and the losers losing. If everyone wanted the mom and pop businesses to thrive and to be the most successful, then they would take their money there. But it seems like in many cases they don't. And so you could say there's no reason to complain about that. That's just consolidation of market share by successful companies. And um, that's all as it should be because that's what people want to buy. Maybe that's an argument that you can make. Um, also, if we had a different status quo where maybe we didn't have – advertising and media companies um, funding our our news hour and our media uh, through the ad buys that they purchase to show their commercials, then it might have to rely on state funding for the media. So corporate um, overlords controlling the content and quality of news content is one concern, but perhaps the greater uh, evil or whatever would be to have state-funded media because then you'd worry that it would be concealing official um, state misconduct rather than corporate uh, misconduct. Um, so wherever you stand on the issue, whether you're more critical of the status quo or more supportive of what we have, it's the point remains that you should be vigilant about ad messages to see if they manipulate you. Um, there's a famous phrase in Latin, and I want to just kind of close with this. Sometimes Latin phrases are popular even in, you know, everyday life, people that don't speak Latin, like you've heard perhaps uh, carpe diem, meaning seize the day, like take advantage of the day, live in the moment. Well, another popular uh, phrase that's from Latin is caveat emptor. What caveat emptor means is to the buyer, beware. So just setting it off from the notes below. To caveat emptor, to the buyer beware. And I think this is a good motto to carry with you through life because what it basically is trying to say is when you're out in the consumer marketplace making choices about buying things, beware. Be wary. Why should you beware? Well, because you should assume that we live in a highly competitive world where everyone's trying to make a profit off of your money, they want you to purchase their goods and services for the sake of their profit and maybe sometimes not for the sake of your best interest. So knowing that you should be a little defensive minded and critical as you go out into the market. If you're not beware and if you just take uh, offers and claims at face value without any further scrutiny, then you're likely to be one of those people who they say um, a fool and his money are quickly parted, something like that. So. <clears throat> Some might argue that since it's a given that there are going to be people out there, scammers, people trying to rip you off, people trying to upsell you on things, people trying to exaggerate the value of their product in comparison to what you really need or would want. If you know that that's the state of play, then you have to enter into that world with caution and um, careful judgment. Because if you're not and you end up getting ripped off or whatever, then some people might say, well, that's kind of on you because you just weren't careful enough. So it's not like these people that are selling you stuff have a fiduciary interest in you, like they're out to promote your best interests. They're out to make money. That does not mean that they can't have good services and products that you don't want. Obviously, there are many such things, but you, the consumer, should look for your own best interests and safeguard your best interests. So holding the motto of to the buyer beware is, is a probably good um, uh, principle to try and live by at least you know most of the time so then guys what we've done today is we've just kind of finished off our in-class discussions of media and marketing and like I said I didn't think it would take the full time just because of what I saw in the notes there wasn't a, a so much content that I thought I would hit you with like so many vocabulary items so I'm gonna let you have a little bit of time back today if that's all right 
But what you'll do instead for Thursday is watch the videos that I'm going to send as links. If they extend over a 75-minute window, then that kind of compensates for some of the time back that you're getting now. And I'll also mail to you the instructions for the third homework. And what I'm going to do is make it do any time before midnight on Friday next week. So Friday next week is going to be the uh, – what even day is that? Uh, let me try and see if I can find it. Um, <clears throat> so the 23rd. Yeah, so anytime before midnight on the 23rd, you'll be able to send it in to me. You'll see the directions listed in the um, written statement that I'll provide after 11.15 when I'm finished with my next class. So are we all good then, guys? Um, I know that it's a little shorter, so sorry for that, but I think that's just kind of how it turned out with the amount of material that was found in Chapter 10 and 11. So if we're good to go, then we can call it for now, and I'll see you guys back in one week. On Thursday this week, it won't be a class meeting. It's the videos that I'm sending to you, but do watch them. They'll be helpful in completing that homework assignment. And so just monitor the um, titanium announcements that I will be sending out in the next couple hours. Okay, then, thanks so much, guys, Violetta, Gazi, and everyone else. Um, I'm going to hold for a minute because I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks, Nicole, Grace, and everyone else. Take care. If you need anything, do email me anytime, and I'll be in touch. Um, so until next time. Have a good one and take care.